If you want to hear about the true meaning of us and what everything represents, then stick around to the end of this video. Jordan Peele's Us deals with a subterranean society of doppelgangers who rises up to take their place in the sunlight. The concept of literal underground societies has been creepy and fascinating to me ever since I found out that these so-called mole people actually exist. Yeah, this is a real thing, and Peele's pairing of that with another creepy concept, doppelgangers, is bound to leave moviegoers looking something like this. The movie opens with a text card telling of the thousands of miles of tunnels, unused subway systems, service tunnels, and mine shafts with no known purpose. The first image we see is the main character, Addie, watching TV as a young girl in 1986. She's watching the Channel 11 News, one of the many references to the number 11 seen throughout the movie. We'll come back to the meaning of 11 later on. First, there are some Easter eggs. On the side of the TV, there's some VHS tapes, and they may be there to honor some of the films that helped inspire us. One of them is Chud, a 1984 movie about subterranean creatures who abduct people. The relevance of that one should be pretty obvious. And unlikely to bring anyone down there. So. <laughs> they're coming up. Chud. There's also a tape of The Goonies, a 1985 kids film in which a group of children must search for pirate's treasure in an underground cavern, just as the mother and us must venture underground to find her abducted son. The last tape I could make out was The Right Stuff, which is a non-fiction movie about the development of the space program, and I'm guessing that it's loosely related because venturing underground is similar to space travel in that you're setting out into an unknown frontier. The news on the TV goes to commercial and she watches an ad for Hands Across America. The few seconds that this is on screen are the key to understanding this entire film. I understood everything a little bit better when I went home and looked up what Hands Across America actually was and what it stood for. Hands Across America was a charity event that took place in 1986. Participants would donate $10 to reserve their spot as Americans lined up and joined hands for 15 minutes, theoretically creating a chain from coast to coast across the mainland United States. The goal of the event was to raise money and awareness to help combat hunger and homelessness. When Addie goes to the Santa Cruz Beach boardwalk with her parents as a little girl, she's wearing a Hands Across America shirt, and it becomes one of her last solid memories of the real world when she's abducted by the shadow people. At the carnival, her dad wins her a Thriller t-shirt, which she puts on over it. As they explore the boardwalk, Addie sees various carnival activities that are significant. Her father wants to ride the roller coaster, which he calls the Little Dipper. In real life, it's called the Giant Dipper. <laughs> This is either a reference to the idea that Addie is going to be dipping or descending into this underground world, or another way of looking at it is that the Big Dipper and Little Dipper are constellations, and while those above the surface can see and observe the stars, the tunnel-dwelling doppelgangers cannot. There are even a couple of lines throughout the movie about the joy of being able to gaze at the stars. They also walk by and notice some people playing a whack-a-mole arcade game, a visual representation of the people on the surface knocking those who live underground back down, forcing them to stay there. Before wandering off the boardwalk, Addie sees a sign that says Jeremiah 1111, and this has multiple meanings. 1111 represents two sets of doubles, it's also symmetrical, and it's the only time in a digital clock that appears the exact same in front of a mirror. This is assuming that there are slashes through the zeros, as there should be. In culture, 1111 is often considered a lucky or magic number, and I'll be talking more about the references to magic throughout this video. But this sign specifically references Jeremiah 1111, a biblical verse that reads, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon them, and they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. And this could be seen as a religious prediction of the bloodshed that will be brought on by the uprising of the doppelgangers. The last thing we see before Addie leaves the boardwalk is her dad playing rock, paper, scissors to settle a disagreement with her mom. Rock, paper, and scissors each come back later in the movie. The main weapon used by the shadow people is scissors, but the son, Jason, uses a large rock to defeat one of them when they flee to their friend's house across the lake. Then at the end of the movie, the fake version of Addie uses the sharp fire poker to defeat the original Addie, who's wearing the red jumpsuit, and holding the paper cutouts of people linking hands. So this is kind of a scissors beats paper moment. When Addie walks off the boardwalk, she goes from the bright lights of the carnival to the dark beach. And there's also a moment at the end of the movie when they're battling underground, and they move from the lit up part of the hallway into a stretch where the lights are off. The maze that Addie goes into on the beach is called Shaman's Vision Quest. The tagline is find yourself. And Addie literally does find another version of herself in that maze. I also found it interesting that it starts raining as soon as she goes in, because only the surface dwellers can experience rain. But if you're a mole person and you're watching this, don't feel bad because at least you guys don't have to buy sunscreen. 
So she wanders through the mirror maze, and the mirrors are another huge motif in this movie. The doppelgangers are mirror images of the humans on the surface, and there are plenty of examples of reflections as symbols for the copies. She goes through one part in the forest where she sees these distorted mirrors, and that may be tied to the fact that the sun in the underground family is distorted by the burn marks on his face. There are three things that happen before she runs into the doppelganger version of herself. One, the lights go out, and two, all she can see is the green exit signs reflected hundreds of times in each mirror. Although there appear to be many exits, in reality she has no way out. And three, she hears the doppelganger version of herself whistling. Remember those three things, because they'll be important later. And when that shadow girl does turn around and see the original Addie, the scene cuts away before we see her being abducted and the other girl switching shirts with her and going onto the surface. Now I know I'm not supposed to have an opinion, but in my opinion this would have been more convincing if we had seen her start running and then it jump cut to her doppelganger getting back to the parents in the boardwalk so we think, oh okay she made it back alright. But then in the reveal at the end of the movie it shows the shadow Addie running after her and dragging her back in before joining the parents at the boardwalk. It would have made it a little less obvious I think. But instead it cuts to the shot of the rabbits in cages. So let's talk about the meaning of rabbits. Rabbits are often seen as a symbol of reproduction because they're known to reproduce very quickly. The people underground are reproductions of the originals on the surface, with scissors sometimes being seen as an image associated with a vasectomy, the surgery that prevents you from producing offspring. There's also another idea that's commonly associated with rabbits, and that's magic. The most classic magician's trick involves pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Well, it just so happens that the shadow Addie grows up and has children, and her son Jason is interested in magic tricks. He has a lot of peculiar things about him. At the start of the movie, he's wearing a Jaws shirt. Perhaps this is just because Jaws is a fellow beach set horror movie, but it could also have to do with his fascination with the monsters. He wears what I think is like a werewolf mask throughout the entire film. Addie also has a daughter, Zora, who's wearing a shirt with a rabbit on it, and it seems to be only interested in texting. And a husband, Gabe, who participates in cringeworthy dabs and has a love for boats that's not shared by any of the other family members. After meeting the family, we cut back to the aftermath of Addie's childhood boardwalk incident and discover that the doppelganger version of her wouldn't speak after being found by her parents, who of course have no idea that it's not the real her and think that it's some kind of PTSD. She sees them meeting with the doctor through a mirror. I think that the reason that she doesn't speak is because when the doppels come up from underground, it takes them some time to adjust to breathing our fresh oxygen. She's unable to speak properly until her lungs have adapted to the fresh air. That's why when the original Addie comes back up to try to take over the surface, she sounds like this. There's further proof later on when the family flees to the other house and Gabe's friend's wife is seen screaming and laughing in the mirror but no sound comes out. So as the family settles into the beach house, there are a few pieces to note around the house. There's a shot of a spider crawling on the table under a toy spider, an early clue that the real Addie is crawling beneath and it's the fake one that's on top, on the surface. This imagery also connects with the song that the doppelgangers whistle when they arrive at the house, the itsy bitsy spider. She expresses that she doesn't want to go to the Santa Cruz beach, not because she was traumatized there as a child, but because she knows she'll be in close proximity to the tunnel network, and she's afraid that something could happen. Her walls are covered with artwork of Alvin Ailey, a known dance choreographer, and at the end of the movie, it's revealed that it was her dance recital when she realized that she was in control and she could be on the surface. It's as the doctor told Addie's parents, the best they can do for her is allow her to draw, write, and dance. Jason enjoys playing inside the cabinet slash closet, the door automatically locks when it's closed, so he props it up with this little toy ambulance thing. It's literally his lifeline, and also Gabe and Zora are saved at the end of the movie when they come across a real ambulance and get supplies. Inside the closet, I spotted games like Guess Who, Magic, and Candyland. Guess Who is literally a game where two identical sets of people are lined up on opposite sides, not that different from the way that this world is set up. Magic is obviously a part of Jason's passion for magic tricks, and Candyland, I guess there's a version where the characters are all rabbits? But I didn't have that one as a kid, I had this one. The mom finds a rabbit doll in the drawer and she's affected by it, but it isn't entirely clear why. It's because it reminds her of when she was trapped underground until she made the switch. So they all get in the car and go to the beach. Zora mentions something about how she thinks that the government is putting fluoride in the water so that they can control us, a slight allusion to the fact that they could all be controlled by those living underground. As they're about to arrive, a dead body is wheeled onto another ambulance and this guy is holding another Jeremiah 1111 sign. This signals the beginning of everything that happened that day at the boardwalk repeating itself leading up to the arrival of the tethered family. Their long shadows as they walk onto the beach signify that the shadow people are drawing near. 
The Shaman's Vision quest is now Merlin's Forest, another magic reference. Gabe's friend Josh bickers with his wife, just as Addie's parents did on the boardwalk all those years ago. By the way, they have twin daughters, another example of mirrorism. They even have a moment where they say the exact same thing at the exact same time, and then both jinx and double jinx each other. Just like 11-11, this is an example of a pair of doubles. The scene with them later at the house pays homage to the Grady twins from The Shining. I'm pretty sure The Shining has come up like three videos in a row now, and it actually comes up again later in this video. Jason wanders off to go to the bathroom and sees the guy T-posing, or at least that's what it looks like. And I think this is the first guy to come up from underground and start the new Hands Across America chain. His mom freaks out when he's gone because she knows about the subterranean society and she's afraid that Jason could be abducted. When they get home that evening, Gabe is watching the Giants game. And if you listen into the audio in the background, you'll hear that the score is tied 11-11. Not long after, when they tell their son to go to bed, the clock reads 11-11 p.m. There's also a Lego Ferris wheel in the boys' room, a reference to the rides at the beach boardwalk, and a picture of Merlin on his bedroom wall. He's also wearing a tuxedo shirt, which makes him look like a magician in uniform. His mother gets worried when she realizes that he's drawn a picture of the T-posing man from the beach because she possibly realizes what this is. In the bedroom, she stares into her reflection in the window as she expresses her concerns to Gabe. She tells him it feels like a black cloud is hanging over her and she feels a storm coming, very similar to how it started raining when Addie entered the mirror maze all of those years ago. Then the three things that happened back then happen again. The power goes out, all the exits are compromised, and whistling can be heard from the doppelgangers. When we first see them, they're all holding hands like the Hands Across America commercial. The shadow people take over the house and explain that they basically don't have good lives down below and they want their time in the sun. They want to be untethered from the bodies of the original family. Each character goes off and battles the shadow version of themselves. The struggle between the two mothers is symbolic because Addie forces her doppelganger into the glass table, and we see it crack, representing the barrier between the two versions of that character being broken. Each character is able to fight off the other version of them, and together they flee for Josh's family's house for help. But by the time they get there, they've already been taken over by the doppelgangers. One of Josh's last actions is telling the virtual assistant to put on good vibrations by the Beach Boys. The lyrics describe Addie's fascination with the world on the surface. I love the colorful clothes she wears and the way the sunlight plays upon her hair. I hear the sound of a gentle word on the wind that lifts her perfume through the air. The next verse describes the shadow Addie sensing the underground uprising. Close my eyes, she's somehow closer now. The other song that plays has lyrics that are a little more on the nose. F the police straight from the underground. This literally describes what happens where the cops are unable to help them because so many people are being attacked from underground. After defeating the copies of the neighbors, we get that second Shining reference that I promised. Jason just gets done saying something about how there are too many twins when they turn on the news and discover that these people are supposedly coming out of the sewers. The time is displayed on the bottom left corner of the news overlay, and it's now 2.37, a reference to room 237 in The Shining. The family drives away in the neighbor's new car, and they eventually encounter Jason's doppelganger with the mask again. He's luring them into a gasoline trap. This part is a little bit confusing, but I think what's happening here is that the two kids, Jason and Zora, have the power to control the red suit doppelgangers because they're both half shadow people themselves. So it would appear that Jason uses that power to walk backwards and drive his creepy doppelganger back into the flames. He saves his family by doing so, but it also leads to him being kidnapped. We also get a look at the huge group of doppelgangers linking hands along the coast, and the T-posing guy from before has 1111 written on his forehead which predicts more trouble. So Jason's mother goes down into the forest maze to try to rescue him. Then the two versions of Addie face off underground. I'm gonna put everything together and talk about what this movie actually means and what it's trying to say, so don't go anywhere. Or someone will drag you underground and you'll never come back. So, during the final showdown, Addie explains her three-decade plan. How she was abducted by the mole people, she basically put together her own Hands Across America campaign, and she explains that whoever created them was able to duplicate their bodies, but not their souls. Which I believe is why they're violence to the surface dwellers, because only one of them can inhabit that soul. Everything they have down below is just a crappy simulation of real life, but in spite of that, they're human too. They're made up of flesh and blood, just like those on the surface, and they deserve an equal experience, and should not be overlooked. That leads us into what I think Us is trying to say as a movie. The people on the surface represent everyday people leading normal lives in developed countries. Sometimes they don't fully appreciate what they have. 
In the scene where the Shadow family breaks into the house, Addy describes the differences between those who live on the surface and those underground. The surface people get warm, delicious meals, while the subterranean society has to eat cold, raw rabbits. The kids on the surface get nice toys, but the toys underground are cold and spiky. She also describes the differences between the two seemingly parallel families. She tells the story of a girl who had a shadow, how they were connected, tethered together. The girl married a prince. Although the family sees Gabe as sometimes jealous of his friends, friend's car, house, and boat constantly one-upping him, a family such as the Doppel family would be happy with what he has. She also describes how the girl in the story gave birth to a son. Jason is sometimes criticized for being a bit strange and wearing a monster mask, but the shadow girl gave birth to an actual monster who acts like a real beast and needs to wear a mask to cover up his scars. The idea is to be happy with what you have and not lose sight of the fact that there are less fortunate people among you, maybe even living below you. Just as Hands Across America was organized all those years ago, the people living underground revive it in a much bigger way to bring attention to the cold, sad lives that those born underground are subjected to by staging their own movement. The final shot of the movie is a huge sweeping overhead shot showing the massive amount of people in red jumpsuits forming a Hands Across America chain. The shot is very reminiscent of the 1986 commercial that was shown to us at the very beginning of the movie. Of course, if you have another interpretation of this movie or any things that I might have missed in this video, be sure to let me know in the comments and check out the playlist on the left to see all the things you might have missed in the trailers for the upcoming horror movie Pet Cemetery. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.